This movie could just as easily have been about how badly we need Jesus, but instead it's about how badly we need the gods and a return to pagan thought and ideology in a world gone mad. They're telling us to believe this stuff and then telling us that it's all metaphor. Right. That, that's the ironic part of this whole thing. The world isn't an awful place just because time and technology have changed the way that we live. Where's their power? They're made in our image. They are not above nature. So what is there to worship or venerate or ally with here? That's the question that this movie never answers. This is the type of messaging that they push on you when they want you to make that trip down to the altar too. Mm. And my thought with that line was, you know, for all this talk about change, these gods sure do have an aversion to it. It's not about a return to pagan ways and remembering the old gods. It's about not letting modern world distractions keep us from noticing what's going on around us. Welcome to Unbound, a podcast for new atheists and lifetime atheists, ex-evangelicals, truth seekers, and free thinkers. There is life after faith. And life here is good. It's time for a new perspective and a better conversation. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell, and it's time to get unbound. Change, change, change. It's the concept that this movie tries repeatedly to drive home, and also the production budget, evidently. Hmm. I'm Spider. And I'm Shell. And tonight we are looking at a movie made with an iMac and Final Cut Pro that can't stop talking about the evils of the modern world. Hmm. It's Ego Trip Productions, The Spirit of Albion, And although I didn't catch on to it back in the day, the name of the production company is more apropos than I ever realized the first time I saw this movie. (laughs) I loved this movie back in the day, and I still have a soft spot for it and all its cringeworthy delights. This movie exists within its own genre, and that being pagan evangelism. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's wild. And I'm pleased to report it's every bit as cheesy as any Christian movie that attempts the same. There's so much to say about this movie, but before we get into it, more proof that Christians have zero clue about what's actually in the Constitution and Kenneth Copeland's declaration of independence from COVID, Hmm. because he can do that. He can do that. He's Kenneth Copeland. He can do that. It's Christians Behaving Badly, Weak Constitution Edition. Ooh, nice one. I'm glad you approve. What have you got for us tonight? Well, first up. David Barton has found a new lie to tell the churches about the Constitution. He's made his career off of being a liar. Most of them do. Yes. Like the PhD Barton claimed to have that was later revealed to be a hoax. He also once wrote a book about Thomas Jefferson that contained so much disinformation that it was pulled from the shelves. Think about that one for a minute. There have been a lot of nonfiction and a lot of Christian books that certainly have had enough lies or just errors in them, but this one was so bad that it was pulled by his Christian publishers. Now that's bad. Humorously, it was called The Jefferson Lies. Wonderful. Yeah. I mean, part of me says that it's a truth in advertising sort of thing. (laughs) But I don't think that's what he meant. But I don't, no, no, I don't think for a second that that was what he meant. Yeah. Unfortunately, it doesn't keep Republicans and Christians from adoring the guy or taking his lies as truth, since they cater so well to their worldview. A couple of weeks ago, Barton put forth a new lie, and it's just a perfect encapsulation of how Barton operates. He makes something up. No one calls him out on it. And over time, just wait for it, it becomes gospel for the Christians who think he's a serious historian. The incident occurred at a pastor's luncheon in Tennessee. Barton claimed the U.S. Constitution was only ratified after being approved by churches, something that is utterly false. Of course it is, but we're talking about a group of people that are never going to call him out or ask for proof. No, they're, they're not. They're face value. They don't want to read the Constitution. They don't want to study about it. Of course not. They, they just want... want to be told what to think. Right. Because that's how they op- that, That's how their minds work. They want someone else to tell them what to think. They don't want to come up with their own ideas, their own conclusions. Here's the pertinent quote from Barton's keynote speech. He says, once they got the Constitution finished, it's not the document of the nation yet. You have to have it ratified. You've got to send it to the 13 states and get it ratified. And so they sent it to the 13 states. If you're going to receive a government document and have a debate over whether to ratify it, where are you going to send it? The state capital? No, that's not the way it happened. 
North Carolina, Connecticut, Massachusetts, the ratification conventions were held in churches. They sent it to churches to ratify the Constitution? Yeah. Okay. I feel like there might be a little bit of truth to this, but I also feel like it's a play on words. It is. They sent they they may have sent it to churches, but that refers to the buildings yeah. that were often used for a lot of different purposes. Right. In a lot of towns, especially in New England, you had your school, your town hall, and a bunch of other things all in the same building with just one or two rooms. Right. And yes, you probably went to church there too. So was it sent to churches to be ratified? Well, maybe buildings that were used for churches, yeah. but, but not to the churches themselves. No. Well, he goes on to state, then each state had to select a certain number of delegates to attend the ratification conventions. 44 of the constitutional ratification delegates were ministers of the gospel. So again, preachers were highly, highly involved. 44 preachers out of more than 1,750 delegates is not highly involved. No, not at all. They were just a few of the many educated men that were involved in the ratification process. True. Yeah, you see, that's, that's, that's the logical right. way of interpreting this. But they're not going to take that approach with the people that they're trying to reach with this messaging. No. Because it's just a little bit too much for them to think about. And it also steers a little bit too close to the truth for their mm. taste. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like these people are not evangelical. These people are just educated. Mm -hmm. They studied the Bible. They might not even have the same type of belief. They might just be deists. True. There's, there's the kind of lie where you just tell a lie outright. And then there's the kind of lie where you withhold certain right. pertinent bits of information so that the, so that what you're saying meshes with the with the messaging that you're trying to convey and the messaging that would be more easily swallowed by the people that you're trying to convey it to. Yeah. Unfortunately, this story is easy for evangelical Christians to swallow whole. It contains all of the things they like to hear. Until they start looking for and finding the truth and speaking up against Barton, he's just going to keep doing it. And they're not going to. They're not going to. You know, it's right there in their own book, that whole that whole business about gathering around themselves teachers who will say what their itching ears want to hear. Yeah. That's right there in the book. Right. You know, so this is precisely what we're seeing. And it's it's far from the first time. And it's, no. it's definitely not the only context. No. But that is precisely what's going on here. Your own book warns you against this stuff. And yet here you are just being carried off by every wind of doctrine. Yeah. That's, that's, an, that's another warning that's right there in the book. Yeah. And yet these are the types of things that they engage in all the time. Yeah. And we all know these verses. As evangelicals, they're kind of pounded into us. But, right. but just like with anything else, as soon as that messaging doesn't jibe with what's comfortable for us, then all of a sudden it just sort of flies out the window or we put it on the back burner and say, well, you know, maybe that's true in certain contexts, but this guy makes a lot of sense. So we're just going to listen to him anyway. <laughs> yeah. That's, that's pretty much how it goes. Right. All right. So now we get to talk about Kenneth Copeland. Oy. Yes, I know. I, I sound so, so enthused. Well, that's because he's ridiculous. Oh, beyond ridiculous. He's, yeah. he's, he's pure evil in so many ways. Okay, let's get this over with. <laughs> Kenneth Copeland, having fought COVID in his own special way for over two years now, declares that it is done and never coming back. <laughs> Unreal. I mean, he's tried a lot of ways to overcome this disease. Remember the halcyon days of 2020 when he placed his oily hand against the screen and through the magic of touching the television, cured precisely no one. I do. And a few days later when he declared it gone because Christians prayed it away. I do. And then a couple of weeks later when he declared it gone, Again! Oh, I remember all of these things, and yet I'm still wearing a mask in the car giving my driving lessons. Yes. Because it's gone. Because Kenneth Copeland decided it was gone. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And who can forget the next month when he commanded it to go away by spitting and blowing it away? That's a, that's, that's a surefire way of getting rid of a communicable disease, yes. Yeah. 
The next year, he called into his daughter's service in August of 2021 to declare it gone because he saw a blanket of blood, but angels crisscrossed over a golden cloud that came out of it. And he knew the final takedown of this synthetic virus that has been made by men as a weapon has fallen. It's destroyed. How many because times? I mean, it's easy to lose count the number of times that this one idiot <laughs> has declared this thing over and done. Yeah. It's, it, it's, it's mind-blowing to me how he still has anyone watching him but and does. listening to him and sending him money. Oh. It's mind-boggling. They have sent him so much money that his daughter is doing the grifting now. Well, yeah. I mean, she's learned from the best. Huh. A lot yeah. of these guys learn from him. We we actually went through that in one of our earlier episodes. Oh, yeah. He has all kinds of little protégés out there. Oh, it's terrifying. So, of course, his daughter's going to be in on the deal. Yeah. But for some reason, as we approach over a million deaths in this country from Copeland... Copeland. Well, you know, you're not wrong. I'm leaving that in. <laughs> You're not, you know, no, so, so he's not responsible for a million deaths. He's but, responsible for some of them. But he's, he's definitely responsible for a handful. So I'm leaving in that little Freudian slip. Okay. Okay. Because I don't completely disagree. Maybe not a million, but enough to, to at least point a finger at him for some of them. He doesn't even want to concede that the virus ever existed. Of course he doesn't, because no. it, it, it doesn't do anything for his credibility to now backpedal and say that this was a real thing. He's going to keep with this narrative probably until the day he dies. Probably. Which, Lord speed the day. <laughs> I think I just broke shell. <laughs> Let me settle for a minute uh -huh. before I try doing anything else. Holy crap. <laughs> God. Here's a quote from him. Now people have gotten used to going to church online, but COVID is gone and it's not coming back. And I'll tell you what, its little brother is not going to do anything either. That thing's over for good. Okay. Uh, it's So first it never existed. Now it's gone. Now it has a sibling. I don't it's, know. It's, it, the stupid is strong with this one. Always has been. But, Always you know. has been. I'll tell you another thing. It's going to be really hard to get the American people to fall for that again. They're not going to do it. There's a lot of things that happened will, that will be corrected and never, ever happen again. I am believing with all my heart that the medical community got some really, really big time learning. They didn't keep their oath in a lot of places. Fear of losing their jobs, they would not treat the people what they knew would get them well. The, the way that he talks. I don't understand and it. And it just, I mean, and the funny thing is the angrier he gets, the less yes. coherent he becomes. Oh, yes. Yes. And you can tell he's kind of ticked off. You can always tell when Kenneth like, Copeland is pissed off because it kind of, it, it descends into worse than that. Yeah. It and did. in a lot of instances, he becomes pretty much... Um, unintelligible and uninterpretable yeah. with the things that he says word this, salad yeah yeah word salad to the word salad to the max with plenty of cheese <laughs> and then he chanted never again like that's gonna do anything well it's gonna do as much good as anything else he's done you know <laughs> blowing on it spitting on it yeah putting his greasy hand up on the screen yeah Ugh. yeah hemet meta goes on as i write this the city of Philadelphia has reinstated its indoor mask mandate because that's the responsible thing to do in the face of rising infection rates. If nearly a million COVID deaths won't change Copeland's tune, it's not like another giant batch will make a difference. No, of course not. And that's news to me. I mean, it's feeling so much like we're starting to wind down from this and then bam. Yeah. It just reels its ugly head again. But and I have people, no, well not I don't I don't want to say people like it's a lot of people, but there are, are a couple of people who have given me grief about this recently in terms of, you know, well, do our kids still need to wear masks in the car? Well, you know what? Is it still out there? Because I can't afford to be down for two weeks. You know what I mean? I cannot afford to not be in this car. And for me, it's not so much a life or death thing anymore. It's just the disruption to my livelihood thing and having to answer like dozens and dozens of inquiries 
about, you know, when can my kid get back in the car again? You know, let's just all work together. Let's do this for as long as we need to do it. And, you know, we'll take it day by day, week by week, month by month. But, I mean, look, look what's happening. Philadelphia yeah. is reinstating their indoor mask mandate. Yeah. And the, it's just going to keep going in waves. Until, it is. You know, I don't know when we're going to actually see the end of this, but I know that I'm not going to be responsible for spreading it. No. My yeah. company's not going to be responsible for spreading it, and I'm not going to I'm not going to bow to any pressure to lift the uh, the company mandate for right. masking. You know, I don't care what anybody else is out there doing. We're going to make sure that everybody stays safe. Right. And these people don't care. They see nothing past the, the tip of their own nose. Mm. Quite literally, they see nothing past the tip of their own nose. And with idiots like this out there continuing to tout their rhetoric, we're never going to get anywhere with these people. Not that I think that we could anyway. No. But with all of these reinforcements to the idiotic things that they believe and the unfounded, very heavily biased opinions that they hold about this, there really is no end in sight. Yeah. And... I you know, know, the more they push back, the more this thing is going to continue having an impact on us. When do we want to get back to normalcy? I mm-hmm. mean, I I would have liked it a year ago. Uh huh. <clears throat> I would have liked it. I would have liked to have not gone through this at all. But the simple fact that it's still a thing, and the simple fact that it's a thing because of attitudes like this that keep propagating through many many channels, and a lot of them evangelical. Yeah. The fact that we are still in the midst of this is infuriating to me. I know. It's infuriating. It is. Um, it's frustrating. And, you know, I, I I don't like being treated like I'm an alarmist. This is not an alarmist thing. We're dealing with this as part of our reality now. And, you know, it doesn't look like it's going anywhere. And that kind of sucks. Yeah. To put it plain and simple, it just plain sucks. Especially for those of us who are in the position of having to maintain policies in the face of so many places, businesses starting to lift their mask mandates completely. It's like, keep it up. We're going to be right back to where we were in 2020 in, in, in short form with the very next variant. Yeah. Well, I have one more in related news. Okay. Right Wing Watch's Twitter feed reports Christian nationalist conspiracy theorist Lance Wallnau we haven't heard that name in a while, mm-hmm. warns that the New World Order will inject everyone with a vaccine that can do surveillance under the skin. Well, that's nothing new. Christian nationalist conspiracy theorist Lance Wallnau warns that the New World Order will inject everyone with vaccines that can do surveillance under the skin in order to track who has negative reactions to Antichrist Biden. <sighs> you know, I don't even know what to say to this i mean it's we we've heard similar shit yeah. recently but it's just it, it gets more bad shit by the day with this doesn't i know it? it's exponential it's like a fractal everything looks the same at every like outermost point mm-hmm. and it just keeps going and getting crazier and crazier and more erratic and just yeah it's amazing to me that these kinds of things even get out there but, I mean, when you think about what these people believe, just in terms of their own faith, then it really isn't that outlandish to to think that they're going to just swallow something like this hook, line, and sinker. I mean, you don't, right. have, you don't have to be evangelical to get behind conspiracy theories. There are plenty of people who are not, oh, no. who are who would totally buy into this. But it's like, you know, they, they actually want things to be this bad. Yeah. And that's the crazy part to me, is that they, these people on some sick, perverse level, actually want things to be this bad. Right. And so they concoct these cockamamie, sci-fi-based conspiracy theories that make things seem like they're exponentially worse than they are. Yeah. And, you know, honestly, that's kind of what this movie does. Yeah. In certain ways, it's kind of what it does, is it vilifies certain things about the modern world that they can then turn around and use as uh, as part of their apologetic and say see we have the real truth here and you need to embrace this so before i get any more into that commentary because we're going to be spending a good bit of time on this movie tonight i just want to let you guys know that our patreon is active at patreon.com slash unbound podcast network 
And we appreciate and thank you in advance for just considering helping us out financially if you can. If you can't, then there are plenty of other ways that you can help us. You can help us with your likes, your shares, your five-star ratings, all the things that make podcasts grow. And here's the big one. Tell someone new about the show this week. Out of the now 108 episodes of content that we have out there, and for those of you who keep coming back week after week, we thank you for your support just tuning in. And we hope that you're getting out of this show everything that you personally need. And if you are, then share the love. Let somebody else know that we're out here and what we're doing and let them browse through those now 108 episodes of content and find the one thing that's going to resonate with them or, you know, piss them off. I don't care. Whatever gets them to listen because the logic and the reason are going to find their way through their ears and hopefully to their brain. You know, they talk about planting seeds all the time. Well, plant your own. Plant some seeds of logic and reason and secularism in their heads and get them to understand what precisely it is that they're involved with with this religion because most of them don't have the first clue and they need to. They deserve to. And you can help with that. Patreon.com slash Unbound Podcast Network if you can help us with money. But more importantly, help us in those other ways. Let's get this word out. Let's throw a few more starfish back into the surf and let's help some people get their lives back. Next week, I'm going to try a second time to put together an episode on the history of Christian violence. I'm calling it a brief history of Christian violence, starting with things like the Crusades and the Insurrection and the good old Malleus Maleficarum. All of these things are going to um, have a little bit of uh, airtime with that episode, and then we're going to move more into the modern world and how all of this stuff that's been done in the name of Christianity over the years culminates in things like storming the Capitol and other things that have happened recently, you know, bombing abortion clinics and that kind of bullshit. We're going to go through a bunch of that next week and show how it all ties together, how modern Christians have been taught to think and behave this way from way back, long before there was an evangelical anything. They've been, Christians have been taught to think this way about their religion and what its actual goals are. And it may be enough of an eye-opener for your evangelical friends to start seeing this thing for what it is. So that's going to be next week. The next movie on deck, which we're going to be doing in about a month, I couldn't help myself. We're going to take apart the Mark IV classic, A Thief in the Night. Oh, God. We're going to pair that with some commentary about just just how ridiculous it is to try and scare people to God. Because the reality of it is that the the fear doesn't usually last long with most people. No. You know, it's they have a visceral reaction to a movie like this. And then, you know, once once the feels start to wear off, so does the sense of urgency to pursue this thing called Christianity. And we're going to show how. As we analyze the movie, we're going to dig into more of the psychology of this one and not just the content itself. Unlike tonight's selection, where we're just going to go in here and take this thing apart because (laughs) this is the most Christian pagan thing that I've ever seen in my life. Yeah. They really did take a leaf from the evangelical playbook when they were putting together the concept for this movie. So again, before I get too far into it, let's just dive in and get this conversation started about the spirit of Albion. So like I alluded to just a couple seconds ago, this movie and how it played out was very familiar. Mm. It basically played like the type of thing that I would have written back in the day, only with a pagan, not evangelical spin. It had all the earmarks of a skit that would have won teen talent at nationals. Mm. And I know because my stuff went to state three times. Okay. (laughs) And honestly, a lot of the stuff that I used to write for our teen talent entries back in the day played a lot like this. Yeah. With the same kind of extremism and the same kind of coercive kind of feel that this movie has. Because there is extremism and coercion that goes on in this movie. And, you know, there's a part of me that really dislikes talking about it this way because right. I love this movie back in the day. But, you know, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And this is my free, clear thinking head looking at this movie with new eyes and seeing it in a very different way than I did the first time I saw it. This movie is very underdeveloped 
with very in-your-face messaging about everything that's wrong with the world and a message of uncomfortable absolutism about how to solve the world's problems. This movie could just as easily have been about how badly we need Jesus, but instead it's about how badly we need the gods and a return to pagan thought and ideology in a world gone mad. The characters are very two-dimensional, and we are never really given a chance to get to know them that well. Right. Just like an AG teen talent teen skit. Incidentally, I don't even know if this even made it into my notes, but that's kind of how this started out. It started out as a stage play that was put together by some pagan youth group of some kind out in out in yeah. the UK and it uh, it centers on the music of Dom the Bard who was one of my favorites I'd say number one favorite yeah. for pagan artists back in the day and you know his music had the same effects on me that any Hillsong's CD would have back in the day also yeah he's a talented guy and he knows how to uh, to push the emotionalism in his music that's yeah. for sure and a bunch of kids got it into their head. Hey, let's let's just write a play around around some of these songs, and that's precisely what they did. And a few years later, some other people got it in their head. Well, why don't we just make a movie about this? Yeah. And that is where this movie came from. It started out as this little small time stage play, and became an even smaller time movie. <laughs> so, so the overlying theme of this movie is that modern life has corrupted humanity and a return to simpler ways that are rooted and built up on the actions and interactions of the gods is necessary to restore order to your life. This mirrors the evangelical concepts of our lives being unmanageable and miserable without Jesus and the imperative need for personal faith and practice. Same message, different divine intervention. (laughs) Over and over again, we hear the people in this movie talk about change. They need to make a change. It's a nebulous concept that the movie never really expands on, only frames the lives of the main characters as empty and without good direction. That direction comes in the form of embracing the old ways and the old gods. So let's meet some of the key players in this movie, the three or three and a half main characters in this movie. Yeah. First, you've got Esther. Esther is a corporate underling who's fed up with the corporate world and the shallow people that make it up. She is passive and compliant and strives to be the best at what she does, which revolves mainly around pleasing her employer, her clients, and anyone who asks anything of her. She clearly has social anxiety and doesn't like being around a lot of people, but she also has an empathic sensitivity toward people that we will see as these events unfold. Next is Annie. Annie is framed as an out-of-control, promiscuous drug addict who takes solace in the arms of men she doesn't love and in the pills that, quote, help her feel better when she feels ill. She has estranged herself from her brother, who is a priest, who has his own baggage to carry, mostly in the form of doubt about his own religion. Then there's George. George is an anti-war activist whose brother is active military, so there is the constant clash between his own convictions and what his brother does. And at the start of the movie, George's brother is off on another tour and leaves the house fuming over George's views. He tells George that they're going to have a little chat when he gets home. But, spoiler alert, that doesn't happen. All right. Because George's brother dies in battle. And he dies while they still have all of this stuff out on the table. Nothing gets resolved, and that's part of the reason why George kind of amps up his activism and the things that happen to him are a direct result of that grief so those are your three main human characters we're going to meet the extra human characters in a little while but these are the everyman kind of characters that this story sets up so as the movie begins we see lots and lots of nature shots and Mm. and it really is it's it's a beautiful and idyllic sort of way to start this movie The nature shots are probably my favorite part. I mean, there's like the opening and the ending song are like the best parts of the movie. Yeah. Because they're, they don't have anything to do with the story. (laughs) Well, actually, the the first song has everything to do with the story. Well, yeah. But I see what you're saying. The, the, The imagery, the way that they set this up. But you know what? We, you see this in evangelical circles, too. Right. They present the most peaceful and beautiful and idyllic kind of message that they can, and they lay the whole foundation of what they have to say on 
all of this beauty and loveliness because Christianity is so beautiful and lovely and God is so beautiful and lovely. And that's kind of what this movie is trying to say from the very beginning. It's punching the idea that there's beauty in nature and that there's ugliness in the modern world and the way we do things. Right. Once we get a few shots of some pretty trees and pretty flowers and and lots of green things and, and babbling brooks and all of the things that they show us in the beginning, we hear this voiceover. The land is changing. And it sort of just hangs there for a couple of minutes. And back in the day, I'm just sitting there with rapt attention waiting to hear what's what I'm going to be told next. The other night, watching this through very secular eyes, my first thought was, no, the land isn't changing. Society is changing. The land is doing its thing just like always, with the exception of climate change. But, you know, that doesn't seem to be her point at this at this juncture. They will kind of touch on it a little bit later. The concept to me is incredibly nebulous and doesn't really seem to have any root in fact because mm. the land itself really isn't changing. How we perceive it may be changing, but the land itself is still, I mean, the grass is still growing mm -hmm. and it still rains and it still snows and it, you know, it's been business as usual for a long, long time. And then we hear this. Now you say the land belongs to you. You split it with artificial boundaries, fiercely protecting your little piece from those you should call your brothers. And at this point, we see this really sad picture of Stonehenge through a chain link fence. The next thing we hear is that an owl doesn't know borders. A fox doesn't know when it's crossed from England into Wales, from Surrey into Sussex, from one garden to another. And I'm sitting there thinking, right, and there are no foxes on city planning boards and no hospitals built by owls. And just so we're clear, if the world existed without borders or government, there would be no infrastructure. All you would have is your mountains, your valleys, and a bunch of people living to the ripe old age of 29. Hmm. And the land has been divided this way since the beginning, even in the Bible and way earlier. Right. How can you criticize things like international boundaries? Or property lines. Or, yeah, even just property lines. Yeah. But, you know, it's the, these things have been part of the equation since the quote-unquote old times that they are trying so hard to revive. There were uh, lordships and fiefdoms and all of that stuff. People owned their own property. People owned other people as property. Mm. These, these have been things pretty much from the beginning. From Sumer forward, these have been realities in human society. So next we hear that every day, millions of people wake up in the morning with bleary eyes and make their breakfast. Some will turn on the television. Others will climb in their cars and switch on the radio. Even more will get onto a train or bus and open the paper. And what is the first thing they see every day? Politics, death, violence, and the inane stories of so-called celebrities. And slowly, inch by inch, the world becomes a grayer, sadder place. They're really uh, pumping the feel-good aspect of this, aren't they? <laughs> you know, I think that whole opening is incredibly cynical. The world isn't an awful place by definition just because time and technology have changed the way that we live. But then we find out that there's hope. Oh, that's awesome, isn't it? There's hope. The old ones have not abandoned you. Listen, there are stories to be found within the landscape. Listen, and you will hear the voices of the Fae as they watch you move through the trees or sit beside the stream. Listen, listen, listen. This is how they used to prepare us for guided meditation. Yes. And it's one of the ways. This was all quite familiar. And, you know, looking at it now as an outsider, it's like, yeah, that was kind of sneaky. You're trying to pull us in so that you can dump the messaging in there just a little bit deeper. Mm. And with that being told a dozen times to listen, we get to listen to the first song, which is Pagan Ways. All the songs are by Dom the Bard. And I'm going to do a little commentary on some of these songs. Probably not all of them. Right. But this one in particular, um, the line that really gets me here. And honestly, and if, if I'm going to be honest with myself... This music resonated with me a lot, but right. there were certain things, especially about his music, that were directly responsible for my mind shift away from theism. And right. there's a line in this song that says, do you dream of drinking from the grail? 
that the truth is held within a tale. Um, a tale cannot be the truth. If it's a tale, it's not the truth. Either it's a tale or it's the truth. It can't be both. But, you know, this is Evangelicalism 101. The, the stuff that we believe as Christians is equally as um, implausible as right. anything that we're going to get out of this movie. I also found it interesting that he puts a line in here about how Arthur sleeps now ready to return. That to me looks like a direct parallel between the second between that and the yeah. second coming of Christ. So there's so much messaging here that runs parallel with evangelicalism. It kind of makes a person wonder what some of the influences were on the people who made this movie. Are they dyed in the wool pagan or did they have the same kind of background that I did? Mm. I have no idea. I feel like it, it's probably the former, but could be the latter, because I don't know a lot of pagans who think this way. I really don't. I don't no. know a lot of pagans who would present the messaging of what they believe in this way. I feel like some of these people, at least the ones who wrote this play, and maybe some of the ones who decided to make it into a movie, had at least some kind of influence that wasn't exactly pagan right. and might have been exactly evangelical. There are too many undercurrents here. I have to wonder. I don't know, but I have to wonder. So basically the point of the song is that the gods are real and we should definitely be paying more attention to them. And now we're going to hear about several of them. Right. So he bullet points several mythologies. And then there's a verse about the Morris dancers, right. which I, you know, I, I think that it's an interesting tradition. You can Google this oh, sure. and you can find all kinds of videos. It's an, it's a neat little tradition, but the line in the song that corresponds to them is the seasons blessed are not by chance. And the suggestion there is that the world works the way that it does because people do a dance. Hmm. You know, and that's that that's that's toxic messaging if I ever heard it. Right. Um, but when you when you look at it from the standpoint of science, right, the chaotic nature of our universe definitely does suggest that the seasons are kind of chance. You know, <laughs> a lot of things had to line up the right way for us to have the world that we live in and, and have it uh, function the way that it does. But these things are determined by science. They're not determined by whether or not someone does a dance. Right. So we got to keep that in mind. And so we get to the end of the song, and it's just Dom the Bard singing. It's kind of a music video inserted into the middle of this. And when it's yeah. over, we get back to our, uh, our voiceover artist here, who now we get to see face to face. And she says, and what about us, the old gods? created by, oh here's the line here's the line created by man in his own image where are we now now that you need us more than ever still watching still here and there's that lovely evangelical sentiment that our lives are nothing without jesus except this time we're subbing out jesus in favor of the pagan gods mm -hmm. and the line about created by man in his own image that was another thing that pointed me out Right. That, that pointed toward the exit for me, because if that's true, then they only have power because we give it to them. Right. I mean, they're with us anyway, because we invented them. Right. And it's so, like, oh, so, okay. They can live inside your head. I mean, yeah. that's, that's, that's entirely up to you if you want to give them that, that space to mm -hmm. exist in. But that's the only place that they exist or will right. ever exist. And I thought that it was kind of remarkable that this movie just makes that statement and puts it out there like, you know, after you say something like that, you still have something to believe in in the first place. Yeah. Because you really don't. If the gods are created by man in his own image, then they're no more powerful than we are. Right. They couldn't be. Yeah, that was a problem I had with paganism when I actually started. Mm-hmm. Is that they were telling all of these stories as if they were true stories, including all the Greek myths that I'd learned in like middle school and right. understood that these were like stories. It's like, do I have to believe all of these other things now? Well, you know, I, in my experience, there were people out there who believed that a lot of this stuff was literal truth, but many, many more that understood that it was allegory. Right. There were that's... many more that understood that this was all allegory. The gods were, in fact, human constructs, 
And these right. stories exist to help us learn a little bit more about ourselves. Mm-hmm. So I never really had a problem with either of those interpretations. Right. You know, there was a part of me that wanted them to be real. And there was a part of me that made them very real inside my head. Mm-hmm. But the, the further I traversed this journey in paganism, the more it became apparent to me that, that it was just liter- just all in my head. Yeah. And, oh, yeah. And that right there was the thing that flung the door wide open to me just exiting religion completely. Right. So this movie and some of the music in it actually had an influence on me getting out. Right. And, I mean, you want to talk about counterproductivity? That's not <laughs> what they were going for. No, They weren't sure not. looking to show people the door. They were looking to add to their fold, which it, it's still, it's, it's an enigmatic concept to me in a pagan context. But, you know, now we're going to bring the main characters into this. Because the person that we're seeing, well, not person, the goddess that we are seeing in this scene, we will learn later is Arianrod. And we'll learn a little bit more about her as we go along. But for right now, she's just this godlike figure right. who is there to impart a little wisdom to the common folk. Mm-hmm. And she says, and if the pressure, the pain, the despair, and the doubt become too much to bear, call to us and we will find you. It just doesn't get more evangelistic than that now, does it? Mm-mm. And then as she says all of these things, we focus on each of the main players. You've got Esther under pressure. You've got Annie and her pain. You've got George in his despair. He's sitting there holding his brother's dog tag. So we know what happened at that point. And then doubt. That's all about Annie's brother who's sitting there reading his Bible and slams it shut and picks up a drink. Yeah. This is how they go about explaining what, is going on in each of these people's heads. So again, very evangelistic in the way that it's presented. But you know, at that point in my life, this messaging worked well. Oh yeah. It told me that there were gods out there who had compassion, who were actually like me, who weren't the God of the Bible with his rampant narcissism and anger management issues. Although this is not a hard and fast rule by any means in in yeah. pagan pantheons, okay? Yeah. Some of the pagan gods have those less savory qualities too. But at least most of them are honest about it. I'll give them that. They know who they are. And they don't try to present themselves as something that they're not. But just the notion that there were legit benevolent gods out there looking out for me was very comforting. Any notion of religion is comforting, especially if you're watching something like this and thinking that your life could use a bit of a remodel. (laughs) And, you know, that's really part of the the whole pagan and Wiccan thing. Right. It's a path of self-improvement. So they used the right messaging here and they used the right right angle for the audience they were going for. So now we actually meet each of the main characters and get an idea of their plight. It's here that we learn all of the things that I mentioned about them earlier, so I'm not going to go through it again. But the running thread is that at some point, they all murmur the phrase, help me, or just help. And all of a sudden, we see them being escorted into this wood by people who were basically strangers. I mean, it's normal as fuck to follow strangers into the woods on Halloween. I mean, what could possibly go wrong, right? And that's another (laughs) interesting bit here. This movie takes place on Halloween, a.k.a. Samhain, where the veil between the worlds is the thinnest. So this interaction between the gods and people was, I don't know, easier because right. it was Samhain, I guess that's that I think was that's the, the point. I think that was the point. So the first one that pipes up is Esther, and she speaks repeatedly about how beautiful the place is where they've all been led. Of course, we don't get to see any of it. It's just a dark wood with a tiny fire yeah. that seems to never go out. And Annie, being the voice of reason, actually just points this out. She says, it's a wood, and it's fucking freezing. Yeah, it's October 31st in England, and no one, no one is dressed for it. Like, (laughs) not even remotely. No. So now everyone's there. You've got all of the main characters and these um, escorts, I guess, if you want to call them that, that no one knows who they are yet. But uh, there's all these people that are kind of gathered around, and now it's time for the everyone say your name part. 
Now, I saw this and did this so many times. I mean, VN, yeah. group ministry projects, youth classes, Bible camp. This is standard practice. Yeah. To go around the circle and tell the people a little bit about yourself. Every Wiccan circle I've ever been in. Oh, yeah. Any religious context, to be yeah. perfectly honest. This is a thing that happens. So now we get to meet Rob, who seems to be the MC for the goings on. And this, just so that we're clear, is actually Robin Goodfellow. For any Shakespeare buffs out there, um, Robin Goodfellow is decidedly not a god, but will allow it. Hmm. He's in that realm of the otherworldly. So I guess uh, he gets a little bit of a He's hall a pass. Spirit. So Annie equates the goings on in her very Annie sort of way to being, quote, a lot of self-help hippie bollocks and turns to leave. Esther beckons her back. I mean, Esther's really into this, and we have no idea why. I'm, I'm not sure why either. I always thought it was kind of weird that she was so enthusiastic. Yeah, it's it's like she's the glue that kind of holds this group together. Yeah. And there's no measurable reason for it, like, at all. But then again, like I said before, these characters are very two-dimensional. You never get to, to know them. So we're never going to understand why it was so imperative for her to make sure that these people stuck around. That wasn't her job. It, no. it was not her job. She took on the role all on her own. And in far too little time, these people basically become the breakfast club with random adults shadowing the teeners and Ari and Rod kind of lurking in the shadows. So now it's time for Annie to tell about her day. And she presents this picture of her life that revolves around testing drugs on bunnies and living a life that appears to revolve around pills and sex and not much else. Right. George says that he got hit in the head at a peace rally. How that brings him into the woods at night on Halloween is, you know, that's beyond any of us. Now we're actually going to interview Esther about how she came to be part of this little powwow. And we cut to her workplace Halloween party. Um, Esther seems to have a bit of social anxiety. And her usually demanding boss is now trying to get her to put her work down and join the party. She's kind of hiding behind her work. At this point, she doesn't want any part of this, mm. but she's also got this big case that she's working on for a client. So she was she was prepared to work late anyway. But now it's like, turn off your computer and go mingle. I don't think that there is anything that Esther wants to do less at this point than actually go mingle. Yeah. But then the client that she's working for on this case shows up and asks if she can have a chat with Esther about everything that's going to be happening tomorrow. But oddly enough, she immediately changes her tune and says she'll come talk to her tomorrow. Now, back in the day, you know, I thought that this was kind of a ham-handed transition, but there was a reason behind it. It's kind of like the whole, you know, whenever the muggles get close enough to Hogwarts, they remember, <laughs> like, really important appointments that they were missing or something like that, and, and they hightail it out of there. Or a Jedi mind trick. It could have been the Jedi mind trick, too, because I, I don't think that Carrie was in the frame at that point, but she she just sort of shows up, but we know that she's behind this. Oh, yeah. You know, that's then it took a while for me to figure it out, but, you know, that's pretty much what's going on, <laughs> is that she was getting everyone out of the way so right. that she could have this chat with Esther. Um, and Carrie, of course, is Caridwin, and those of us who were, who were watching this with that particular set of eyes already understood this. Oh, yeah. So Carrie just appears out of nowhere and asks Esther, where's your costume? She's like standing behind Esther. So it's not like she appears poof in front of her. She just sort of fades into the scene and asks, where's your costume? And Esther asks, asks what her name is. And she says, you can call me Carrie. And then more of this, um, this is what's wrong with the world kind of talk. She says, everyone's just always wearing a mask. So what she's saying here is that people are basically all fake and going about their lives of quiet desperation. And then she asks Esther, what mask are you wearing? You're not happy, are you? And here it is again. Clearly, Esther isn't living her best life and is withholding about her real feelings. And she's about to be given the solution to this little problem in her life. She's not terribly pleased with that characterization. She fires back with, you know nothing about me. So Carrie reaches out to her and says, tell me, and gives her basically a magic poke. And there's this uh, little light that comes out from her palm. And it's almost, I mean, there were a couple of things that I thought of here. 
First one was E.T. healing an ouch. <laughs> and then that whole thing that, that Spock does with the Vulcan mind meld. Yeah. You know, there are parallels here. But the effect is that uh, Esther stops being offended and starts spilling the beans about how fake people really are. And we'll see more of this little bit of hocus pocus later because they use it on all of them. Yeah. And then we get to hear about Samhain, you know, the real Halloween, back when it was real. And Carrie starts giving all of these details, most of which we went through when we talked about Halloween. Yeah. Um, so not much new to report here. She talks about some of the traditions and how different things were back in the day, that sort of thing. And that right there is a wonderful segue into the song Sow and Eve, which uh, was one of my favorites. Oh, one, yeah. That was one of my favorite Don the Bard songs. There's there's a lot that goes on in this song, but you know we're we're gonna kind of breeze past it, only to stop for a second and look at this line that says the hunter of souls we will see. Now, as this line is being delivered, this is where Caridwin is basically leading Esther away from corporate hell and directing her into the woods. You know, call me crazy, but. I'm not sure I would want to follow a complete stranger who just told me that the hunter of souls we were about to see. I'm not sure I'd want to be following anyone into that scenario. No. But uh, no. But wait, wait. Esther apparently knows the song, too, because now she's taking a verse. That's just the way that this goes. Yeah. And it's, it's so ham-handed. It's like there's no context for this. There's no reason why there should be any interaction between the main characters and anyone singing these songs because they haven't been exposed to any of these concepts yet, but somehow they just know and sing along. That's kind of an irritating part about this whole thing too. Yeah. My favorite part of this is where we are looking out a window at night, mind you. We're looking out a window at night into a sunny glen where the Morrigan is standing in the rain and also joining in with the song. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it really felt more campy this time around. Oh, I, yeah. I was I was so much more into this back then. Well, of course. But, oh, my goodness, this is just, it's it's oozing with camp. It's just, it's that bad. So Caridwin convinces Esther to follow her. And for some reason, now they're out in the country, far away from corporate hell, Caridwin is showing Esther all of this old-timey, pagany stuff. The message here is that this is what the world should look like. It's a world unpolluted with corporate greed and modern conveniences and pollution and all of the bad things that have made their way into, quote-unquote, the land over time. Next is Annie's story, which, you know, there's not, there's not much to this. We already know what's happened previously. She's been propositioned by her coworker, and casual sex seems to be a thing that she just sort of does, and he knows, and she doesn't take a whole hell of a lot of convincing. Right. So after this very suave proposition by this really not terribly um, appealing kind of yeah. dude that she works with, she goes home with him, and we pick up the scene the next morning where she is uh, is basically doing the walk of shame and tucks into a local breakfast nook where she orders coffee and just coffee. Just a quick little note here. I loved the order, this guy's breakfast oh, order. <laughs> this scrawny little thing. Yeah. He probably weighs 100 pounds soaking wet. And maybe a little more. Okay, let's 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 be fair. Maybe a little bit more, but not by much. No. And this breakfast that he orders. It's like a full English breakfast twice over. I was gonna say it's like it's not a full English breakfast. It's like an English breakfast that you could share with your friends. Yeah. And it's like I envy anyone who can eat like that. I know, right? I, I've never been able to, and I, I will never be able to. But uh man, this this dude had an appetite and it was just entertaining listening and to him give his order. And the person he was with is like, I'll have an orange juice. Yeah. That's it. Yep, that's it. Just orange <laughs> juice. Um, and later on, when everybody just sort of flies out, before the waitress has time to bring the coffee, it's like, oh, we'll have them. So, I mean, like, oh. you might might as well just uh, just just keep up the whole thing. You know, why not just buy out the entire restaurant while you're at it? I mean, you seem like you have <laughs> the the uh, the appetite for it. But that's enough of that. That's, that's side information. But, it's, but at least it's, it's a little bit of uh, levity to ease the tension. 
So uh, Annie is sitting there waiting for her coffee, and then again, like out of nowhere, a very good-looking stranger asks if he can sit down. And, you know, I'm sitting there thinking, well, he's a step up from last night. I'll give him that. He has a very airy, almost Jesus-y quality about him, but this ain't Jesus. He's more of a satanic Jesus. Yes. Devilish look with a lot of messianic posturing. That's mm. I think that describes him well. And my, is this dude judgy. He sits there and basically goes on a diatribe about everything that's wrong with Annie's life. And this line, you want to talk about judgmental? Most people go back to their own beds at night. Like it's any of his fucking business. Yeah, right. And then there's more more zappy zappy as he reaches out to her and he literally says to her, your life, so empty. And boom, zap. And with that, Annie's brother shows up in this little cafe. Yeah. And Annie at this point is just done. Clearly it's not the brother who's creating distance here. Or at least not the only one. No, not the only one. But I think that she does a lot of her own alienating. I think that there's more of an open door policy with her family than she wants to let on here. And her brother definitely is concerned about her, but he goes about it the wrong way. Well, yeah. He, just the complete wrong way. So now they're all, and she, she's, she's trying to leave. She, she tries to get up and leave. And now she's flanked by her brother and Mr. Suave, who's still sitting at the table. <laughs> And now they're all, for whatever reason, they're all just sitting around together. Um, her brother, who we never learn his name, is just a wee bit confused about what's going on. Has no idea who this guy is, but he's not asking a lot of questions. And uh, there's definitely some tension. So there's a um, few moments of conversation before things just exploding in. And this time Annie is really done and she just gets up and walks out. And that's where the whole coffee thing comes in. Next scene, we see Tall, Dark, and Handsome following Annie and her brother into a parking garage at the diner. Some yeah. things about this movie just don't make any sense. But uh, <laughs> Annie drops her purse and some orange Tic Tacs fall out. I mean, that's what these quote-unquote pills look like to me. And it's probably what they were. Mm, so probably. the mysterious stranger appears out of nowhere and grabs them. And then her brother is like, well... You probably sold him to her in the first place. <laughs> and here's the whole sympathy for the devil thing that was mandatory and inevitable. He says, you never met me before and yet you judge me on sight. Some things never change. Now, those of us in the know realize who he is. This is the horned God appearing in human form. And Annie's brother does, he, he, he kind of concedes that he was being a little bit of a jerk. He says, I'm sorry. And uh, I'm just going to call him, for, for the sake of simplicity here, I'm just going to call him Hearn because that's one of his personas. Yeah. Um, Hearn then just sort of shrugs it off and says, I'm used to it. You know, talk about a persecution complex. Yeah. But well, we're going to find out more about why later on. I mean, it's obvious to anyone who's in the know what the, what the issue is here. The whole thing with uh, with Satan versus the horned god or Pan or any of the other things that Christian occult art decided to borrow to yeah. make their representations of Satan. But yeah, the, the horned god here appears to have a bit of a persecution complex. Not that it's not warranted, at least from his point of view. And his message, his evangelistic message to Annie is that if you want to find peace, you have to look beyond the modern world and become reattuned with nature. That's the basic message. And again, it's just a way of segueing into the next song. He says, feel the divine in nature. Like any of this is going to improve her mental health or elevate her self-image and or help her confront her own demons and addiction and anything else. It can all be solved by, you know, feeling the divine in nature, getting back to the land as it were. And that's a good segue into the song Land, Sky and Sea. And the line that caught me here, even back in the day, it caught me, is where Dom says, cynical thoughts and lies that distort all that is true, they disappear when I feel that you're near, when I'm with you. And I got chills just reading it again because of what it represented then and how much it tied into what I wanted to believe as a Christian too. Yeah. You know, everything's better when God is around. Yeah. You know, everything's better when Jesus is around. 
Well, everything is better when you set your sights on nature and feel the gods in nature. That's the message here. Just parallel messaging again. And this song also decries different kinds of fakery and paganism, like charlatan card readers. He calls them neon magicians who offer the fools their gold. Mm. Um, there's more, but that's the general gist. And just on a personal note here, they really could have used a few more takes with these songs. Yeah. None of these people are great singers. And, I mean, uh, no. and the horned god, Hearn, um, yeah, pitchy as fuck through the entire yeah. goddamn thing. But uh, it didn't bother me back then. I noticed it, but it didn't bother me. This yeah. this time it was like nails on a chalkboard. But this particular song definitely got me back in the day. And it got oh, me yeah. a lot. You know, I do wish. I'm going to go right on record here. The spider's going to be as real as, as, as he's ever been here. I do wish that this was all true. Yeah. It jived well with me. It really was a beautiful, idyllic way of seeing life. And it did help me in a number of areas. I oh, mean, yeah. with all due respect, I discovered a lot of things about myself as a Wiccan. And that led to the weight loss. That led to me getting into therapy. There were all kinds of things. Oh, yeah. It was very, very good for me on those levels. But the problem is that none of it was true. And I just wish that it could have been. I yeah. wish that it could have been something that I settled into and that it could have just been me for the rest of my life. But even then, even sitting there watching this movie, there were those things that just kept pinging at the back of my head. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I couldn't get away from it. You know, I've said many, many times before, my rational mind was clawing for purchase right. and it wanted to be heard. And, yeah. you know, this time in my life was no different. But there were a lot of influences then that led to some very positive things. And I think that it sucks that it wasn't real. Yeah. I really don't have an angry bone to pick with this particular part of my life. No, I mean, me neither. I remember way more of the better times, probably because one of the first classes I took, uh, there was the line spoken by the teacher, the better your imagination is, the better things are going to work for you. And that's sort of like... You said the quiet part out loud. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they're apt to do that. Yeah. Because it's true. Yes. So with the quiver in my liver kind of subsiding now, thinking about the song, and, you know, I've been thinking about these songs a lot the last few days. They've been running yeah. through my head, like, constantly. But let's talk a little bit about George's story, because he's the one who's on deck. So he is at, I'm going to use the Britishism here. He's at the casualty department. They don't have emergency rooms in no. England. They have casualty departments. And this was kind of a dismal kind of casualty department. It yeah. was kind of like um, Kingdom Hospital. It, it oh, had a God, real, yeah. real Kingdom Hospital kind of feel to it. The green tinted fluorescent yes, lights. Yes, yes. Everybody you know. looks sick. Yep. Or, you know, the, the other thing I thought of was Clarice walking down the hallway to talk to Dr. Lecter. E. It kind of it kind of had that kind of morbid sort of feel to it. And yeah. I'm not sure that that, was, uh, that wasn't uh, completely intentional either. So he's, he's there with some kind of head trauma and his friends are pleading with a very salty nurse to help him. And they're not being polite. No. So the, here's where we get probably the most idiotic line in this entire fucking movie. She stomps back over to them and says, don't shout at me. I have a clipboard. Whatever the fuck that means. I, I'm not sure. I I'm, have I'm, a clipboard. It's one, one of the worst threats I've ever heard. <laughs> um, so George's story basically is that he went after a dude with a brick at a peace rally. So I'm not sure how him throwing a brick at somebody got his head injured. They never tell us. No, not really. Because uh, apparently the brick didn't involve his head. So uh, I have no, I still have no clue how he got injured. But, you know, we don't really have a whole lot of time to think about this either because yeah. now another mysterious stranger appears and there's more zippy zappy. She wants to take a look at the wound, but she's obviously not a doctor or a nurse or any kind of medical professional. She doesn't look the role at all. She just sort of looks at him and says, I think you're coming with me. There's the hand on the forehead, and then George just collapses. And that's all we see at that moment. But we see him again in a few minutes, so I guess he's okay, right? So as he interacts with who we learn later to be the Morrigan, there's more grandstanding about the arrogance of war, and the obvious solution to that problem 
is getting back to nature. Mm -hmm. Because now we're going to hear the pipes of Pan, which is another song about how the world is going wrong and how it needs to return to its pagan roots. So they're kind of monothematic with the music in this, but they were trying to make a specific point, and they found like seven or eight or nine songs that actually made it. Right. And this song is also about the dangers of secularization and a lack of ability to see and feel the divine. So with all of that out of the way, we've got all of the key players have been dealt with and sung to at this point. So now we turn the spotlight just for a second on Rob or Robin Goodfellow. He's the one who's basically responsible for all of them being there. But they they don't really know this. He, as far as they're concerned, no. he's just an, another person in the group at that point. And they ask him what brought him here. And his answer was, I've been here for ages. So <laughs> I just, I find it so funny. His appearance, he looks... He looks like a member of Duran Duran from 1985. Yeah, he kind of does. He has a real Simon Le Bon kind of look about yeah, him. Yeah, and I'm just like, oh my God. Yeah, just- yeah, I, I, I completely agree. Um, incidentally, for those not in the know, he's uh, this This is Puck from A Midsummer Night's Dream. Okay? Right. That, that's that's his actual character. So he tells them, he, in, in his MC responsibility sort of way, he says, you've been given the chance to stop and take a look at your lives make a change. There it is again. Change, 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 change. And he says, outside this place, everything is the same. And I'm thinking to myself, oh yeah, these people saw The Breakfast Club. This <laughs> this is a conversation right out of The Breakfast Club. What happens on Monday when we're not all together in this space and in, in this cohesive little group? What happens then? And it's another, another ham-handed segue into a song that not at all coincidentally parallels the things that every one of these main characters is going through. Well, at least, at least Annie bit, and and George, yeah. because there are direct parallels, at least for those two. So just to give you an idea of what you get in this song, and I, I think that they kind of truncated this one down a little bit too. I yeah. think that they took out at least one verse and just sort of sized it down to fit what was going on in the, in the scene. But here's Annie's verse says isn't it wonderful isn't it right there's nothing as worthless as an animal's life but it helps me feel better when i feel ill i can't taste the pain in this little pill a thousand lives given to live just a few more years it's only human i can somewhat agree yeah i can somewhat agree with that but i don't think that people need to be shamed for living longer because this is where their medicine came from no. you know there if if you if you look at a lot of the things that help us with our health and well-being, some of it has some very, very unsavory roots. Oh, yeah. And worse than torturing bunnies, okay? Yeah. Way, way worse than torturing bunnies. But I get the point, and I can at least agree in spirit. And then here's George's part of this. Isn't it holy, isn't it good that people kill people in the name of their God? A bomb for a father, a bullet for a son, and a smile for a child that carried the gun. Only one God can be right when all is said and done. It's only human. And that kind of encapsulates next week's topic. Because <laughs> yeah. there's there's a degree of truth to it, too. So it's not all BS. It's not all alarmist grandstanding at all. But still very overdone. And the lyrics to that particular song, very overdone. And this is the part I mentioned earlier where they do kind of give their opinion about things like climate change and they're not wrong about that either it's just that the approach is way off yeah there's the there's that uh, that part about uh we tear down a forest for grass that won't grow we watch the seas rise with nowhere to go that kind of thing yeah. there's a couple more lines in there but that's the gist so coming out of that song we get rob's take on all of this and he says people don't change they just change what's around them to suit themselves which there's a degree of truth to that too. Mm -hmm. But I do think that it's kind of an alarmist way of looking at time and progress and what we've accomplished as human beings, because that may be true, but not all of those changes have been bad. As a matter of fact, a lot of those changes have everything to do with the fact that we actually do live past the ripe old age of 29 now. So not all progress is bad progress. And I'm sitting there thinking to myself at this point in the narrative, there's an overwhelming amount of emotion right. that is being poured out here. And I was also thinking that there's been way too little development for that level of emotion. All of these people are committed to, quote unquote, making a change. 
And it's such a nebulous thing. This is a huge issue and a huge hot button for religion in general. Because this is the type of messaging that they push on you when they want you to make that trip down to the altar, too. Mm, Change is necessary. Change is necessary. Change is necessary. And it just keeps coming back and coming back and coming back in this. So for reasons unknown and without any semblance of an escort like the rest of them had, now Annie's brother shows up. (laughs) How how did he even know? I, I, I have no clue how he even knew how to get there. And there are people out there thinking right now, well, silly, one of the gods definitely uh, led him there. And that's probably true. The gods, at this point, they get a little defensive. I don't think they trust him very much. They all break from their purely human characters and become, what, the mighty Morphin Celtic Rangers? That's what it felt like. (laughs) It's all very superhero, anime-tastic, and has uh, Saban written all over it. Not Sandy Frank? Well, a little Sandy Frank. We'll, we'll, we'll say Saban Frank. How about that? All right. Works. It's uh, a little lackluster, but they didn't have the budget for luster, so this is what we get. So now we know. We know who these mysterious strangers are. And I got such a Power Rangers vibe off of this part. Yeah, it was You've got, good. boom, Caridwin, boom, the Morrigan, boom, Hearn the Hunter. And here they all are, armed and ready for battle against this roly-poly Episcopalian <laughs> dude who uh, who's just there to check up on his sister. Anglican. He's Anglican. Okay, yeah, well, <laughs> well, Anglican there is Episcopal here. So, I know. You know, I know. it's uh, six of one, half a dozen of the other, but you're right. <laughs> and, and then, and of course, now you get your host with the most Robin Goodfellow, and he's in his, his puck form at this point. Yes. Pointy ears and all. He, he's, he's playing the role really, really well at this point. And, of course, Annie's brother is aghast. He's looking at this scene. He's like, they've brainwashed you. They're they're Satanists and all of this stuff. And uh, the Morgan is not amused with that characterization. She literally cocks her head back and says, oh, come on. <laughs> it's such a not Morgan thing to do. Well... But I'll take it, you know? <laughs> And and Robin has to uh, come back with the same type of retort that I would use in a situation like this. He says, that's right. Every week we get together and assemble under an instrument of torture, eating representations of blood and flesh. Oh, oh wait, wait, that's your lot. <laughs> you do that every Sunday. Every Sunday. The underlying messaging here is that everything that doesn't conform to your worldview is evil. So more parallels in the messaging. Annie's brother then comes right out and says that something led him there. So I guess they sent out the homing beacon. You know what I mean? Some, <laughs> some, something caused him to be there. I'm, I'm guessing what we learn about Arian Rod later, it was probably her. Probably. Who, uh, who kind of drew him there. He doesn't have his own guide, but he's part of the party. He's a latecomer, but he's part of the party. And then we get to hear about his crisis of faith. And that is precisely it. We're told that he has a crisis of faith, and that's it. No reason why, just that's where he's at. That's the level of development that we get with any of these characters. And Hearn then chimes in with, you know, you're not the only one who ever doubts. And then we get my favorite, my favorite Dom the Bard song, because Green and Gray, a.k.a. the pagan sympathy for the devil, (laughs) was the song that cinched it for me in terms of Satan and the existence of Satan. So again, good things, good things came out of this part of my life because this was the thing that did it. I was completely at peace with the whole notion of Satan and hell and all of that. The very first time I heard this song, there's a link to it in the show notes. There's a link to the the, uh, lyrics in the show notes if you have the notion to look for them. But we want to move things along a little bit more. Suffice it to say that the whole song is a conversation between the horned god and a Catholic priest. So there's this whole dialogue that goes on between the two of them. And I I don't think that it's it would be much of a spoiler to tell you who bests who in that battle of wets. <laughs> so um it's it's actually it's a it's a good read if you ever even want to just read the lyrics. Yeah. I think it's a good read. It's a good story. And and it really does go a long way toward allaying any fears about the existence of Satan in the first place. So right. I I think that it 
did me a lot of good. If you're one of those evangelicals on the fence, I can't believe I'm even telling you to do this, but read the lyrics. I think you'll understand what I'm talking about. And you'll start seeing how silly the whole concept of a literal Satan actually is. Right. So now, once we get past that song, there's more about how beautiful it is where they are and how natural and how real and how not weird (laughs) this whole thing actually is. It just feels right. You know, it's like driving a Mazda. It just feels right. Oh, God. Um, And then in true teen talent fashion, Annie gives up her pills. She throws them directly in the fire. You know, this tiny fire that's been burning this whole time with no help from anyone. But before she actually takes the plunge, we get a very ham-handed description of Robin Goodfellow's real nature. He chides her to take pills. Take one, maybe two, because that's (laughs) his impish nature coming out. Right. And they never explain that. We're just supposed to understand it. I thought perhaps part of the point there was that maybe only she could hear him, but I have a hard time with that. So now Annie's pills are in the fire. People's lives are getting better, even as we speak, even as we watch things unfold. People's lives are improving because of their interactions with the gods, okay? So Esther chimes in and asks, well, what do we do with all this wonderful information that we're receiving tonight and all this wonderful stuff we're learning about ourselves? What do we do with it? And Caridwin then goes into, you know, well, you know, if ritual is your thing, then you might want to try that. But, you know, just getting out in nature and communing with with the, with the forces of nature and all of this stuff, that's good, too. It all depends on what helps you feel good about yourself and blah, 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 blah. And then she kind of gives a nod to the Wiccan Reed. It's like, you know, there's there's really nothing that's that's off limits here as long as you don't hurt anybody. Right. So there's and, – and you know what? Nothing wrong with that. I still think that that little encapsulation of the Reed – does have a lot of truth to it, you oh, know, sure. and it's a good foundation for any moral code. As it harm none, do what you will, is the way that it actually uh, reads out. But uh, then George wants to know, you know, why us in particular? And I mean, the obvious answer is because they did the Freaky Friday at the beginning and they all said, help me. And boom, all this started happening. That was why. But, you know, out of everyone in England, these were the only people who cried out for help at that moment on Halloween night. Okay. I guess we'll just have to accept that and move on into the next song, which is um, Caridwin's song called The Cauldron Born. And one thing that I found interesting about this part of it is that they changed the lyrics to the song just very, very subtly, Mm -hmm. because in the original version, Dom the Bard says, deep within this darkened hall, feel the goddess Caridwin call. But in the movie... Just to make sure that you punch the evangelistic aspect of it, it's deep within the dark of your soul. Mm-hmm. Feel the goddess Caridwin call. Yeah. You will dance in the eye of the storm, your Caridwin's children, the cauldron born. Another line that I liked back in the day says, Your life's a construction. One day you will see through the illusion and into the dream. Can we see through the illusion into reality instead? Yeah. Because I feel like that would benefit us a lot more. Mm. Um, so we come out of the song and there's more from Caridwin about how to be a good pagan. Esther asks if there is a literal cauldron and Caridwin says, well, think of it as a metaphor. Mm. You know, they're telling us to believe this stuff and then telling us that it's all metaphor. Right. But that's that's the ironic part of this whole thing. Mm-hmm. Now that we know a little bit about Caridwin, of course, now we need to learn a little bit about everyone else who's part of this group. We hear a little bit about the green man's nature or the the horned god's nature. He's the green man. The passing of the seasons, oak and holly, that's the way that he describes himself. And then we get to the Morrigan and what she's all about. And George is about to find out some shit. (laughs) He's about to find out some serious shit. He's actually offended. He says, okay, so... You get Caridwin, you get the green man, I get the bloody goddess of war. (laughs) And so the Morgan has to then explain to him, well, I'm not really the goddess of war. And, you know, and she really isn't. No. But that's that's part of her nature. In in her mythology, she's the one that carries fallen soldiers into the afterlife. So uh, so why George? He wasn't the soldier. His brother was the soldier. So why does he get the Morrigan? Well, she explains a little bit about, you know, you know, you're you're fighting your own battles, you're fighting your own war. 
in the way that you approach certain things about your life and blah, blah, blah. So it's thin, but the real reason why she's his guide in all of this will become apparent in just a few minutes. But I mean, he's not, he, he's not warming up to her. And Robin, of course, you know, being Robin has to uh, chime in with, well, somebody's got to clean up your mess. And that's the Morgan in a nutshell. You know a lot more about her than I do. Yeah, but, a little bit. Uh, but that's, that really is it in a nutshell. She's there to clean up the mess that, that's created by war and discord right. and all of these things. I mean, there's <clears throat> tons of people who used to die in wars, not only because of the battles, because war brings famine and it, then famine brings illness. Yeah. That's how the Black Plague got started. Yeah. Yeah. You know, she she does kind of expand it out and explain that, you know, it's not just people who fight in wars. It's people who are affected by war right. and conflict and that sort of thing. These are the people that I'm charged with leading into the afterlife. That's her thing. This part made me cringe a little bit hearing it this many years later. She says, death is just a part of life. It's like being born, but the other way around. And, you know, it's like, okay, but there was nothing before I was born. There's going to be nothing after. So I guess in some odd way, what you're Mm -hmm. saying is true. Yeah. But it really doesn't provide me with much comfort. And didn't then either. No. But when you realize that a lot of paganism, a lot of pagan traditions are rooted and built up on the concept of birth, death, and rebirth. It makes sense in that context, but the things that they use to try to um, try to make their point on this don't really make any sense because they look to things like when the leaves fall off the trees in winter. Well, that tree isn't dead. Okay, no. this is not death. This is part of the life cycle of the tree, and it's the tree responding to the changing seasons. The tree doesn't die. It may look dead. It may be very quiet out there without the crickets, but everything doesn't die in the winter. Right. But in primitive pagan thought, that's what was happening. We know better now, and we need to act like we know better now. So Mm -hmm. that whole part of just being born the other way around, it's like, no, no, it's not the circle that you want to make it out to be. There's a start point and there's an end point, and it's time to just start getting used to that and being okay with it. Yeah. So she tells George, I deal with the dead. They're not great conversationalists. But meanwhile, we're about to learn that there's uh, there's a little disparity to that statement. Mm. Robin breaks it gently to George that he is, in fact, dead and that he died in the hospital. So when we saw him collapse, that was the end of George. We just didn't know it then because we saw him again. And, you know, things just really got all sixth sense up in here. Everyone is aghast. It's like, so so he's been dead this whole time. You show him all of these things, and now you're just going to take him away. Well, here's the thing about pagan afterlife. In most modern pagan traditions, you've got mythologies like the Summerlands yeah. and things that are very idyllic and things that you would actually look forward to. You know, much more than the Christian heaven. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah, I'm, right. I I would take the Summerlands over the Christian heaven any day. Yeah. But the thing, the other thing that that happens here is that as she is guiding George on, he's reunited with his brother, and there's that reconciliation that happens there. Um. So you know, it's it's kind of a happy goodbye for George, and yeah. that's the last that we see of him as we listen to the song Morrigan. Which, you know, there's a lot more of this, you stupid humans are just, you're, you're just fucking up your lives and fucking up your world and all of that. It's just more of the same messaging. But there's a couple lines here that stood out. The first one is, I've washed the blood away and each will take their turn. Another life given to me, when will you ever learn? In other words, you know, when will you just stop fighting and be at peace with each other? Well, the answer is we're never going to do that because that's not human nature. Mm-hmm. Unfortunately, that's just the way it is. Yeah. The will of man lies heavy on the land. Until we change our plan, I'll be ready. Kind of threatening and kind of cautionary, yeah. but those lines definitely struck a chord with me then. The thought now, watching this again, was that basically the Morgan doesn't like her job very much. She wishes that she didn't have to do it and right. pretty much says as much 
within the narrative here. This is, in my opinion, kind of a weak treatment of her mythology. Right. Though. It's it's very surfacy. The Morgan is exponentially more badass yeah. than this. But, and she is capable of standing up for herself and her convictions a lot better uh, than what yeah. we see in this movie. Yeah. I mean, well, they treated her as one person when she's actually three. Yes. She's one of them. They're triple goddesses. Yeah. Yep. So it's it's like, you know, you have actually one of the goddesses is like the ins- is called the insane battle cry. You don't want to get on the bad end of Bob. She's kind of scary. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you just stick with. I don't her. think you want to get on the bad end of any of her no, personas. You really don't. No, you really, really, you really do not. Really don't. The Morgan is, in fact, a dark goddess. And mm-hmm. uh, you know, I was actually kind of surprised to learn that you were kind of walking with her back in the day. Right. Because, you know, you, you, you don't strike me as having a very dark nature, but I can also see how this was, was a, a sense of empowerment for you. Yeah. She's a very empowering persona. Right. In, in, in any of her personae, she's very empowering. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot of personae. <laughs> there are many. And so now we come out of this song, and it's more of the same where uh, now the gods are talking about how they've shown these people another way to live their lives. We're told that the gods are not above nature, that they work within the structure of nature. So, you know, where's their power? They're made in our image. They are not above nature. So what is there to worship or venerate or ally with here? That's, That's the question that this movie never answers. Finally, out of the shadows comes Arian Rod, and this is just an excuse for one more song, Lady of the Silver Wheel, and the messaging in this song is is pretty much the same as the rain falls on the just and on the unjust, Yeah, and it definitely does have a karmic vibe to it, Yeah, and uh, there's some of the worst special effects oh, that I've God. ever seen here. I still don't know what that stupid thing was supposed to be. It's supposed to be a castle of glass. And that's instead, the, that's the opening lyric is high in a castle of glass. Yes, but instead, it's more like a castle of aluminum foil that looks mm-hmm. like old Bob from the black hole. I'm dating myself so much with that, the right people will get it. <laughs> okay. But that's what this looks like. And it's just, it's, it's so ham handed and, and it is. so, and so low budget. It's kind of like mystery science theater level special effects. Yeah. You know what it's I mean? like, I'm not sure who designed that. Because that's not the silver wheel. The silver wheel is what she's spinning on. Right. Not it's spinning the disc in. of the moon. <laughs> it's, it's just, it's, it's very instead weird. Instead of spinning, spinning on it, she's spinning in it. Yes. You know, it also kind of, it also kind of brought me back to uh, that one scene in 2001. You know, with that big circular thing. Yes. Yeah, that, that kind of, it, it kind of made me think of that too. But not anywhere near as much as old Bob. <laughs> and this, it, it, it just looks like a beat up piece of tin foil, just sort of spinning around in space. It was very weird. It was so odd. So yeah, apparently it's supposed to be the silver wheel in question, but I think that they kind of got their wires crossed as to what this thing was supposed to be. Like, yeah. But uh, again, more of the same let's shame humanity thing going on in this song. Lady of the silver wheel, I give you chances, you give them away. Translation, your dissatisfaction with your life is your own fault. Mm-hmm. And that's what she's saying there. And again, think of Arian Rod as basically karma. And as the saying goes, karma is a bitch. And with all due respect, so is she. Mm-hmm. Her own mythology pretty much confirms this. She's not a nice being no. by any stretch of the imagination. Among the gods, she is, just to put it lightly, not terribly likable. And her own no. choices in various situations make me think that she and Yahweh would actually make great consorts. Yeah, she's They approach kind of, their jobs the same way. She's impassive. She yes. disregards everything. Mm-hmm. This is her job. She's doing her job. Yep. Hyper-focused and That's fuck it. anybody who gets in her way. Right. Yes. And then there's this line. And, and there's so many things that don't make sense here. Because mm-hmm. there's that line in the song that says, woe to those who see her face. Well, there's a bunch of people that have been looking at her face for this entire thing. And they all seem to be okay. So that's uh, just a little bit more of that, wait, what, that kind of uh, weaves its way through this entire movie. Yeah. You know, I I liked the idea of Arian Rod back in the day until I started reading up on her. I figure 
spinning the wheel of life, uh, spin- spinning the web of life. It's like that resonated with my spidery heart. Yeah. And I started reading up on her and found out, yeah, you know what? This is the same thing that I just walked away from. I really don't need her as one of my go-to goddesses. You know what I mean? No, she's kind of scary. Very. She's very scary. And definitely Yahweh's type. And with that, the whole thing just abruptly ends. Annie and Esther wake up in the morning still in the clearing and just sort of wander off as the gods look on. George obviously is not there anymore. It's like they wake up with a hangover and just sort of stagger off. But they're not hungover. So now we have finally arrived at the last scene in this movie. It's sometime in the near future, and these people and these people who didn't know each other a week ago are now all gathered together at George's funeral, and Annie's brother has um, been kind enough to do the service, and they thank him for that. And one of them, I think it was Esther, she says, I can't imagine what it must be like for the family losing two children. And he kind of shrugs it off in a glib sort of way and says they have their faith and that will help them through. I could get right back up on my soapbox about the concept of false hope here. But in those moments, like I've said before, if there was somebody that was laying there on their deathbed and just praying to go home to Jesus, I'm not going to be the one that burst their bubble at that moment in their lives. No. So I have enough compassion to let the whole they have their faith thing go in this instance. And they start talking about, you know, what happened to them out there in the woods. And Annie's brother says that it's brought him closer to whatever it is. He's not all in with the Jesus thing anymore because of what he's seen. And Annie just sort of looks at him and says, whatever it is. He's like, yeah, whatever it is. Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha, whatever you want to call it. It's kind of, it brought me right back to the first Oh God movie. Yes. Where uh, where God is asked, is Jesus the son of God? And he says, Jesus is my son. Buddha is my son. And blah, 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 blah. And just goes on from there. I thought about that immediately when he said that. And I'll bet you anything, whoever wrote this thought about it too. Oh, probably. Um, So Esther and Annie are talking now. And one of them, I forget which one, says that they can't stop thinking about that night. And they start speculating about what they think happened. And one of them says, on one level, it kind of feels like it was just a crazy dream. And I think it was Annie that says, I feel like I finally woken up. Mm Mm-hmm. And the message there, of course, is paganism equals happiness. So that's how this whole thing ends. It's kind of the happy ending, as happy an ending as you can make out of a movie that ends with a funeral. Yeah. So we find out that Annie has quit her job, but this has somehow improved her life, not having an income or anything to, uh, you know, in any direction at this point. But, I mean, her entire persona is different. She has a positive outlook on her life. She's clearly sober. She is carrying herself in a whole different way. So this is kind of like the honeymoon period after you get saved. You know, everything is wonderful in your life. And you've got that new relationship energy that's yeah. that's aimed at Jesus. And in this instance, I don't know, maybe she's just aiming it within. You yeah. know, I have no idea. I don't think that she's fantasizing about the green man. You know what I mean? No. I think that she just feels like she has a sense of purpose at this point that, you know, she's making positive changes in her life. And these are all good things. She's really the only one that does. Esther confirms that, you know, for her, nothing really has changed that much. She hates her job, but she's not about to quit. She says, I can't just pack it in. It's a nice idea, but you have to face reality. Yeah. So, you know, that to me... It's another accidental truth that they kind of let out into the wild with this. (laughs) And then at that point, the gods show up because the gods have to have the final word here. And they tell Esther and Annie, you're all connected, all part of the great wheel. There's nothing to be scared of. Let go. Look at what has always been here. Because, you know, being one with nature fixes everything. Hmm. The green man, a.k.a. Hearn, whatever you want to call him, he says, open your hearts and minds and listen. So one more song, one more song to round things out. And now you see everybody pretty much out of character because it's Dom the Bard giving this little concert on a hillside. And there's everyone who's been in the movie. And Mm -hmm. they're just and oh, look, they're normal people. Who'd have thunk it? Yeah, Um, this is my favorite scene in the entire movie. They're on a hill in Wilmington in England looking over the 
tall man. Yes. The long man of Wilmington. Yes. Which is pretty darn cool. It's very cool. I'm, that's, that, that is still on my bucket list. Oh, yeah. Not, Definitely. Not, on, not from any pagan context whatsoever. I just want to see that It stuff. just looks so fucking cool. And it's ancient. And, and I, that and is I, so Yes, neat. yes. And, and I definitely want to see it once yeah. before I die. Gives me Absolutely. goosebumps just thinking about it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, you know, things have taken a turn, a good turn around yeah. here. So it may not be the out of reach thing that it looked like a year ago. You know what I mean? Yeah. It might be something that we get to do. And I would I would love the opportunity to see some of these things. Once we get through the song and you see all these happy, these shining happy people and, and sitting around on a hill and singing a nice song, we're finally given the last sales pitch of the movie where the gods come back for the actual final word here. And they say, we're not demons or spirits or Satanist freaks. We're the first ones, the pagan gods, watching our world turn to dust. And again, we're going to end this on a positive, negative kind of note. Yeah. Um, their world is turning to dust because progress and enlightenment are bad. You know, that's what they're trying to say here. And my thought with that line was, you know, for all this talk about change, these gods sure do have an aversion to it. Yeah, they do. There's a real contradiction going on here. They say humans move on from the age of belief and so much stays the same. Well, yes, trees don't typically evolve into cell phones and grass grows no matter what. So what's your point? Then they say war, love, pain, and hope. These things never change. And you know what? There's a reason for that. Because they all encompass this thing that we call human nature. Yeah. Why do the gods who are admittedly made in man's image not understand this? Mm. So then they say, we watch and we wait. Destiny is not controlled by the man in the silver box or the rules you invent to govern nature. Death is part of life. Ending is another word for beginning. There's the little subversive ding at the end there. And now they're going to go for the sale here. They're going to try and make the conversion. And the green man says sarcastically, turn back to your gray lives of order and reason and electronic chaos. Something inside will remember. And then in a very airy and almost threatening sort of way, Arian Rod says, you'll hear us call to you once more before this life ends and your true journey really begins. Because there's so much waiting for us after death, you know? Mm. I mean, it gave me chills and goosebumps back in the day. But now it's like, okay, so we'll see you one one more time before this life ends. And then we won't remember it anyway because there'll be nothing left of us to remember anything. So, right. you know, who gives a fuck? So that's the movie. And just a few parting thoughts here. And, you know, I'm just sitting there as I'm getting to this point in my notes and I'm thinking, God, where to begin? With all of this, I think that if I get too much further into this, we're going to be here until one o'clock in the morning with me going off on a diatribe. So I'm going to try and keep this brief. As a Wiccan, it was made crystal clear to us that ours was not was not an evangelistic religion. That if people didn't find their own path, it would mean nothing to them. But this movie conveys the opposite sentiment. Clearly, you live in a world that has made your path impossible to find. So here we are to direct you to it. Now. There's nothing wrong with appreciating nature. There is, however, a problem with venerating nature and acting like there are forces around us that we can feel and interact with on a spiritual level. The bottom line here is that we live in a physical world. Nature is governed by physics, and there are no gods out there living and interacting with humans in tandem with nature. Giving up your car, your phone, your TV, all any of that will do is make it harder to live in the world that we occupy. It's not about a return to pagan ways and remembering the old gods. It's about not letting modern world distractions keep us from noticing what's going on around us. That's the one thing that I do agree with in all of this. Sometimes you have to stop and smell the roses, but then it's time to get to work or pick up the kids from soccer practice or start your driving lesson or record your podcast. Take Ferris Bueller's advice. Life moves pretty fast. If you don't stop and look around once in a while, you could miss it. Emphasis on once in a while. Even if these people went full dive into paganism, they would still need to pay their rent. We need to appreciate everything about our lives, not vilify the parts that time and progress have made necessities. 
At the end of the day, the only one in this movie who made real change was Annie. She quit her job torturing bunnies. Not sure how she's getting by, but she seems more focused and a lot happier. Esther seems about the same, and Annie's unnamed brother has at least expanded his view of things a little. He at least feels better at the end of the movie about being ensnared by his religion. Pity that he never bothered to question why Jesus wasn't part of this party. <laughs> it's yeah. a legit question. Yeah. In the end, my sentiments parrot Esther's. The notion of paganism, Wicca, and any religion that is rooted in mysticism, yes, even Christianity, all have one thing in common. They're nice ideas, but you have to face reality. And the reality is that we live in the world that we live in. We arrived here when we did by random chance, and now it's time to make our way, experience things, including nature, and build on those experiences. I admit feeling a tug at my heartstrings as I watch this movie again, and especially hearing this music again. These songs have been in my head for days now, and I do get a little choked up remembering how it all made me feel, but that's just it. It's nothing but emotionalism and sensationalism with no real substance. I miss that part of my life more than I will ever miss anything about evangelicalism, but I know that it's nothing but fool's gold. And sometimes I do mourn the part of me that was capable of believing. It's not easy to admit that we're on our own in this universe, but I still choose truth over literal fairy tales because if I have to choose between uncomfortable truths and comforting lies, and I do, and we all do, I choose truth because it's the truth that sets you free. Or as I like to put it, it's the thing that ultimately leads to getting and staying unbound. hope you enjoyed this episode of Unbound. Show topics are chosen based on their timeliness, relevance, and social impact. Have suggestions for future topics? Email us at unbound.podcast.network at gmail.com with all your comments and feedback. Please don't forget to like, share, and throw a few five-star ratings our way and follow us on all major social platforms. And don't forget to hit subscribe if you haven't already. Links to our social pages as well as a full list of cited sources in today's episode are listed in the show notes available at our website, getunbound.org. That's get-unbound.org. If you value this resource and would like to see it continue, please consider supporting us on Patreon at the link in the show description. And be sure to check for new updates every Sunday when we'll come together again and take one more step toward getting and staying unbound. Unbound.